go. Make sure it's recording from the right channel. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the solution of the homework assignment because I know, you know, it looks kind of confusing because, you know, how can we track down the behavior of the program when we don't know what K is, right? That's the, you know, I think that's the most common problem with, these, with this homework assignment. And let me see what I should use for this. I'll just use a regular text editor for this, you know, particular discussion here. I don't think we did the other the homework before this. Hmm? Uh, you gave us an extension on the homework before this, so we didn't do the pre and post condition part one. Oh, okay. For part one, I have not disclosed the solution yet. Yeah. Okay. But I cannot remember the actual code of the first one. Uh, okay. Do you guys remember? Kind of? Wait. Okay. What's the question? The, um, the question of the homework assignment prior to the one that is due today. So the pre and post condition is number two? Number one. Yeah, today is for number two. Let's talk about number two first, and then we can go back to number one if someone has a copy of that. Okay, the one that we work on, or the one that is due today, looks like this. Let me save the file first. So this way, it will remind me if I forget to you know, save it later on in the class. And I'll just save it as text.txt. Okay, the code goes like this. If x is less than zero, is it like this, or is it x if x is greater than zero? Less, 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 less than, okay. And x gets the negation of x, and then line three is else, and then line four is x gets x itself, and then on line five, and if. Is that the, the question? Yes. yes. I think that's pretty close. And you know, remember, less than, and then followed by a dash, is just an approximation of the assignment symbol because I cannot enter a left arrow easily using a plain text editor. Okay, and the precondition of line one is simply to say that x equals k, and I don't give you, you know, I don't tell you what k is. Okay, now according to the notes in the, in the, that we have talked about in the class, we can still figure out what is pre two and pre four, even though we don't know what k is. That's because when we analyze a program using pre and post conditions, we are not tracing the program. In other words, we are not trying to determine which way we are going. We are saying if we go for the then branch, okay, we, land up, we end up on line two, what do we know immediately before line two executes? Or you know, if, it, if we go to line four, immediately before line four executes, what do we know about, you know, the, about the variable? So in other words, we have to explore both directions. We have to explore all possible directions. So in this case, pre-2, if I want to write out you know, what it is, it is pre-1 because I, do, I, will, I, do, I don't have a chance to change anything right before the execution of line 2. So that's why pre-2 is based on pre-1. But on top of knowing what pre-1 is, we also know that the condition of the conditional statement has to be true because otherwise we would not be about to execute line two. This is the row sheet for today. Go ahead and sign it. Is this part okay? Does everybody does everybody understand why pre two is pre one and x is less than zero? Is that okay? Okay. <clears throat> but we already know what pre one is. Pre one is given. So at this point, we know x equals to k, and x is less than 0. <coughs> That's all we have to say. If people want to also decouple what is you know, x and k, or decouple x and k, you can also say k is less than 0. But that's not really necessary. We can just keep it the way it is. And for the same reason, we also know what is pre-4. Online people on pre four. Pre four is based on pre one because right before we execute line four, we don't have a chance to modify x. So whatever was true before line one still has to be true at this point. So that's why pre one still has to be true. But at the same time, since we are about to execute line four, we know the condition of the conditional statement has to be false. And therefore, it is not, it is not the case that x is less than zero. And we can go ahead and simplify this a little bit. 
and just say x is greater than or equal to zero. Are there any questions about pre two and pre four? Yes. Why can't you just um, get rid of the x is less than zero because you already know what x is? Because I <clears throat> because this is actually this this part here is necessary so that at the end we know what how the new value of x relates to the old value of x. So we, won't, we don't want to toss away information unless we absolutely have to. Okay. So at this point, this is what we know. And based on the nature of pre-2 and based on the nature of line 2 and line 4, do we know how to get to post-2 and post-4, given that we know what, our, what the preconditions are? Okay. So let's start with line 2. Okay. So we can say the right-hand side of line 2 refers to the left-hand side. Because on line 2, we have the negation of x on the right-hand side. That obviously refers to x itself. So the right-hand side of line 2 refers to the left-hand side. If I say let f of x equals to the negation of x, which is the right-hand side, can we find an inverse function for that? Yeah. Yeah. It is reversible. Okay. What is the uh, reverse inverse function? It's basically itself. Okay, the negation is is its own inverse. Okay. So since a an inverse function exists, we can use the substitution rule. So to apply the substitution rule, what do we get? We say post two is the result of the substitution operation. We take all occurrences of x in pre-2 and substitute each and every single one with f prime applied to x. It just so happens that in this case, f prime is exactly the same as f itself, so they're, they're both negation of x. So now we move on to the next line. We just have to expand what is pre-2. Pre-2 is this condition here. We just you know expand it here, and the negation of x is f prime of x, so that's why we have this part here. The actual substitution is completely mechanical. We go through this code here. Every time we see x, we replace it with the negation of x. So that's why, as the result of this, we get the negation of x equals to k, and the negation of x is less than zero. Is that okay so far? And obviously, if people want to simplify, this can be simplified. Um, you can say x equals to negative k, and also x is now greater than 0. Okay? That part is optional. Okay? This part is optional. You only have to get to the previous line to get full credit. Are there any questions about how, we, how these three lines you know, work? The first line is just because it is using the substitution rule. The second line is the result of expanding all the things that we know, because we know pre-2 is x equals k and x is less than 0. We also know that f prime of x is the negation of x. The third line is just a mechanical process. We take every occurrence of x in the precondition <coughs> and replace it with neg the negation of x. Are we doing okay? Are we doing okay so far? Yes. Okay. So now we move on and we talk about uh, post four. Post four is even easier. Okay. Well, you know, I wouldn't say much easier, but they're basically the same thing. The right hand side of line four refers to the left hand side because if you go to line four, you can see the right hand side is x itself, and obviously x refers to x. And as a result, we can reason it out. We can say, let g of x is x. What is the inverse of this? X. Just x itself. <coughs> so in other words, g prime of x, which is the inverse function of g, is also just x. It is its own inverse again. 
since an inverse function exists, we can use the substitution rule, just like last time. Except this time we spell out what is post 4. Post 4 is the result of using the substitution operation. On pre 4, we take all occurrences of x and replace each one with g prime applied to x, the inverse function of the right hand side. And as a result, we just go ahead, go ahead, go, we go ahead and find out what is pre 4, which is this condition here. And g prime of x is nothing more than just x itself. In other words, the substitution operation doesn't do anything because we are substitution x with x itself, <coughs> which is fine. That's not a problem. So that means you know, we just copy whatever the precondition is and say that's the result. Are we doing OK so far? OK, so it's basically if we decided to show everything out algebraically, it's just extra work we created for ourselves. Um, I, I mean, mean uh, basically, like the negation and the uh, <coughs> place of x is all about negative one and one, which is what's actually implied there. So if we showed all that, but still got this right answer, it's, it does, it's just a whole bunch of work. Not exactly, okay? Because you know our objective is to find out what is post five, okay? Post five is easy. It is just post two or post four. Because at that point, I don't know which way I came from, and all I can say is, you know, the, the post condition of each branch has, you know, at least one of those has to be true. Yep. Well, post two x equals negative k, and x is positive. How can negative x be greater than zero if it's equal to negative value? But I didn't say k. What k is? Oh, so it could be a negative value and come out to be. Correct. Yep. In fact, if I know x is greater than 0 and x is negative k, I know k is negative itself. Right? So now, you just take a look at post 2 and post 4. Um, I'll just do the lazy thing. Copy post 2. The entire thing here. I copy post 4. <coughs> put the entire thing here. That becomes my post condition of, on line 5. Now, what is that telling me? Is it telling me anything that's useful? These five lines collectively, what, what do they do collectively? They find the absolute value of x. Is that making any sense? Because the first part is saying x is now greater than 0. But x equals to negative k, so that means k was negative. So that means originally x equals k, which means x was negative. Now it is positive. Not only is it positive, it is exactly the negation of what it used to be. Because k was the initial value of x. On the other hand, if x was if k was originally greater than or equal to zero to begin with, we don't make any changes to x which is also the behavior of the absolute function. Because when you take the absolute value of a, a non-negative number, you get the original number back. When you apply the absolute number function to a negative value, then you get the negation of that value, which is exactly what we're describing here. So are we doing OK with this or not? Okay. It is fairly mechanical, okay? You know, this part, this, this is really, really just, you know, mechanical steps, you know, when you apply what we have learned in the previous class. We're going to have to reproduce that for the test? Um, yes, I would say so. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is that correct on the second one? <coughs> you use g of x instead of f of x? Um, just so that we can differentiate so that there's no confusion which one is which. But if we put f of x on both, is that all right? If you use f on both, you know it will it will it will be okay if it is obvious, which I think in this case you know will be fairly obvious. Yep. Uh, back up on the precondition of line four, real quick, where you said it's not less than zero. Can we yes. just say there that can we just plug in the where you did the pre the next step? Can we just plug that out there? Or yes. Okay. That'll be fine. All right. Yep. But this part is important. You have to we have to remember the pre one. 
is still true by the time you get to right before line four. Okay. Any other questions about this one? No questions? This is all good? Okay. I think the network is still down because you know it's not you know getting refreshed here. And let me just make sure. Disconnect the cable, plug it back in, and there's no activity. Disable networking, re enable. It's trying to connect, you know, if it connects okay, you know, this you know this will stop going around like this. I don't think it's it's up yet. My last class actually. Okay. I can always, you know, default to a static IP, but that will mess up, you know, the network in other ways too. <laughs> because if if one computer has already assumed a certain IP address and I just hard code this machine to use the same IP address, then it would the, the two machines will have problem resolving, you know, who is who when we get, you know, packages back. So I would rather not do that. Yeah, I think the network is still down, unfortunately. Yep. All right, so that's okay. We can still work on the, uh, the practice test. Okay, so what we will have today is a practice test. Next Thursday, on next Thursday, we'll have an actual exam one. Now this class is too big to fit into room 152, so what we'll do is we'll take the test on paper you know, for this class. Instead of doing it on a computer, we'll do it on paper. I will give you the question sheet, and on the question sheet I will leave enough space so that you guys can also do your trace on the piece of paper. So ideally speaking, you don't have to bring your own pieces of paper, but if you want to be safe, you know, bring your own binder paper anyway, just in case you need extra paper, you can just staple everything together. But it is still open both open notes. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, you can print anything or write anything prior to the test and take it with you. Um, that includes my own notes. That includes all the previous tests that you can find. Uh, includes all the homework that we have gone through in the class, all the sample programs that we have gone through in the class. Um, if you can find anything on Google prior to the class, you can print it out and take it with you as well. I do not let people use laptop computers during the test. Okay, that question has been you know brought up a few times because some people have laptop computers if they prefer to use a laptop computer to search for information, but that will be kind of a, an uh, unfair advantage to people with computers. Now, I have also heard you know, arguments like, yeah, but I'm so used to a computer, if you force me to do everything on paper, that will be an unfair you know, disadvantage to me because I'm more used to computers. I do not take that argument. <laughs> Okay, you know anyone who can use a computer can use paper just as well. Okay, but other than that, you know, there's no limitation. The only thing that you cannot do during the test is to have live communication with another person during the test. Okay, that's that's the only limitation. Are there any questions? I mean, if you guys want to study together and come up with you know a pile of paper that summarizes you know, all the things that we have talked about so far, but make it in a form that you can search more easily, be my guest, okay? You can, you can all share the same notes you know, prior to the test and use the same notes during the test, it's just that you cannot pass information during the test. Yep. How many questions are gonna be on the test? It'll be around four to five. You know, one, there'll be like three programs that are just tracing, okay? I'll give you the code and you have to trace it. I'll give you pre-formatted um, grids, grid lines, so hopefully you don't have to you know, line your own thing with a ruler, you know. But you do have to write fairly small, you know, like uh, around a 12 point, you know, font. So it's not like tiny, but you know, to some people that can be a challenge. Um, I'll give you one or two questions, you know, kind of like a pre and post condition, but most of the time it is not straightforward, it's going to be like backwards which is the next example. So that, the next example is a you know, practice test example. Okay, so I'll just make sure it is clear. Practice test example. I'll call this example one, you know, the actual order 
you know, may not be exactly the same in the test. Now remember, I'm just showing you what type of question will be in the test. I'm not showing you the exact question that is in the test. So this, is, this may be a lot easier than the one that you will see in the test, or maybe it's not. Okay, so I'll just give you, let's say, line, this is line 65. Line 65 is x gets x times 5. Line 66 is x gets x minus 2. And if I give you a post condition of mm, line 66, and let's just say that we don't know anything about the other variables, and we just know that at this point, x has a value of, oh, I don't know, let's say 73, okay? The question is, what is pre-66? <coughs> so it looks like we are just, you know, okay, first of all, can we do this? Yes. Now, there are two ways to do it, okay? One way to do it is to reverse the steps one by one. The second way to do it is to say x equals to k for some k, and it goes through this whole calculation, and it just so happens that k equals 73 <coughs> after this whole thing, and they can just solve for k. So there are two different approaches to solve this particular problem, because it doesn't have any conditional statements. If I throw in conditional statements, it gets a little bit more complicated. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is to show you how to go back step by step. Okay. So knowing that post 66 is x equals 73, and line 66 subtracts 2 from x, what do we know about pre-66? X is 75. X equals 75. Very good. Okay. So the next one is knowing that post-65, oh, wait, hold on a second here. How do we know what is post-65? We just, we just figure out what is pre-66. How does that relate to post-65? Post-65 is pre-66. Because they are sequential statements, okay? All right, so that's important. Because once we know what is pre-66, it is exactly the same as post-65 because those two lines are sequential. Okay, I'll just put an explanation here because these are sequential. And what else do we know? What what do we know about line sixty five? What what does it do to to x? It multiplies x by five. It multiplies x by five and it's stored it back into x. Okay? So line sixty five multiplies x by 5. So that means the precondition of line 65 is just going to be x equals 75 divided by 5, which means x equals 25 to begin with. Oh, yeah, I cannot do my calculations. Huh? My arithmetic is, is bad. There we go. <clears throat> Are we doing okay with the reasoning, the rationale of the reasoning? But there's another way to do this. If you know this whole thing is reversible, you can you can backtrack all the way. The other way to do it is like this. Okay, there is another way to solve this. So what you can do is to say pre-65 is x equals k. Now, we, I have no idea what k is. But after I do the pre and post conditions, I will find out, you know, x equals, you know, blah, 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 involving k. But it also equals to 73, so I can just solve for k at that point. Okay. So knowing this, we also say that the right-hand side of line 65 refers to the left-hand side. And it is reversible. So that means if I define x, f of x to be 5 times x, then f prime of x is just going to be x divided by 5. Is that making any sense? Is that good? Okay. So this means we can use, can use the substitution rule. That means post 65 is the result of the substitution operation. 
applied to pre-65, we find occurrences of x and replace each one with the inverse function of f applied to x. And what we are doing here is to do the substitution. The precondition is just x equals k. And the f prime is x divided by x prime is x divided by 5, just like that. After the substitution, we have x divided by 5 equals k. Or, if you prefer, we can say x is 5k. Is that okay? That's a lot of steps for something that is really kind of intuitive, right? Because we knew that x equals 5, and we know the statement is just going to multiply x by 5, but, you know, the result makes sense. Okay, after the operation, x equals to 5k. k is not being changed, x is. Are we doing okay so far with this step? Okay. And we can apply the same type of reasoning with the next line. So we can say pre-66 equals post-65 because those two lines are sequential. So that means you know what we, we know what is the precondition of line 66. And then we just apply the same thing here. And I'm, I'm getting lazy. I'm just going to copy and paste. The right-hand side of line 66 refers to the left-hand side, and it is reversible. This time I use g of x, and it is x minus 2 is the original, so that means the reverse, the inverse function is x plus 2. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. And we can use the substitution rule again, and I'm just getting a little bit lazy copy and paste whatever I can, whenever I can. The post condition of line 66 is the substitution operation applied to the precondition of line 66. But this time, we're using function g instead of function f. And pre-66 is x equals 5k. And the substitution is x plus 2. So now, after the substitution, we have x plus 2 equals 5k, but that also is basically saying x equals 5k minus 2. Are we doing okay so far? Does it make sense so far? I don't know anything about k, but I know how x relates to k throughout the calculations. Is that okay? Alright, so now this is the part that is kind of important because we can now combine what we are told about post 66 and also this part here. Okay? We are told that post 66 is x equals 73. This means 73 equals to 5k minus 2. Can we solve for k? Yes. This implies K equals 73 plus 2, and then the whole thing divided by 5, which means K equals to 15. This is how we know X equals 15 on line 65. Because the premise is on line 65, X equals K, since we just saw for K, now we know what x was on line 65, before line 65 executes. Is that making any sense? So there are two ways to go about doing this, you know, simply because in this case we don't have any conditional statements. If we have conditional statements, it's not as straightforward, because they, they will diverge into two paths. <coughs> Any questions about this? No questions? Okay. Let me save this. <coughs> and then we'll do a trace, you know, on some algorithms. Oh, let's see. Go ahead and use my spreadsheet program. The important part is I have to save it to today's folder. You know, once, we, once I save it, I can upload it later on when the network is up.
against the row sheet. Okay. Okay, so here we have you know a loop here, and we say as long as x is less than well, let's not, let's not make it very you know, difficult. Let's let, let's say as long as x is less than seven, do the following. But inside the loop, we say if x mod two equals zero, then we do one thing. Else, if x mod two mod three equals zero, we do something else. And we just say and if at this point x gets x plus one and while I'll fix the indentations. So over here we say I get I plus one. And here we say J gets J plus one. Also remember to indent these two. Give it my numbers. Here's my program. Now, obviously, if I don't tell you ahead of time what is x, i, and j, there's no way you can trace this program. So that's why whenever you see a program like this, you know that in sheet two, I will have to give you some preconditions. x, i, and j. In this case, the precondition is, I'll give you something that's easy. x is zero to begin with, i is zero to begin with, j is zero to begin with. And we'll go ahead and make these numbers, oh, you know, reduce the, the column sizes. Okay. So we'll go ahead and trace it. You know, at this point, it's all kind of go going to be mechanical. On line one, what do we do? We compare x to seven. Is x less than seven at this point? Yes. Sure. When we go into the loop, we go to line two. Line two has to evaluate a condition. X mod two equals zero is, what is the remainder of zero divided by two? Zero. Zero, okay, very good. And, oh, okay, if it is zero, that means you know when you compare it to zero, it is true. So if the condition is true, we go to line three. Line three is going to increment i by one and we get out of the conditional statement. But there's one more thing we have to do before we go back to the beginning of the loop. Which line are we going to? We go to line seven. Line seven adds one to x. X goes from zero to one, and then we go back to line two. Oh, go back to line one again. Line one is asking, x is less than seven. It's true. We go to line two. X mod two equals zero is false, because 1 divided by 2 has a remainder of 1. Okay. And then we go to line, which line do we go now? Four. We go to line 4. Line 4 is asking x mod 3 equals to 0 is false, because 1 divided by 3 also has a remainder of 1. So we, there's no match in the multi-branch conditional statement, we just go to line seven. We add one to seven, we add one to x, x becomes two, and then we go back to line one again. Are there any questions at this point? What was mod again? Was mod it? is to find the remainder of a division. So x mod two is the remainder of x divided by two. Okay? This is something that we talked about last week, so you know, it is kind of important to study you know, right after the uh, discussion in class. So we go back to line one. Line one is still asking x is less than seven is true. Okay, we go to line two. X mod two is zero is x is what? X is two this time. Two mod two is zero is true. The remainder of 2 divided by 2 is 0. Can you scroll up a little bit? Sure. Or I can just extend the bottom here so I can keep going. Okay, if that is true, we go to line 3. What does line 3 do? It adds 1 to i. i goes from 1 to 2. And we get out of the conditional statement. We end up on line 7. Line 7 adds 1 to x. x goes from 2 to 3. 
then we go back to line one. X is less than seven is true. We go to line two. X mod two is zero is false. false. Because this time X is three. Three mod two is one. Therefore, it is not zero. Then we have to go to line four. Line four is asking X mod three equals to zero is <coughs> true. true. We go to line five. And we add one to J. J goes from zero to one. And then we go to line seven. Line seven adds one to X. X goes from three to four. And you can see this is just gonna be boring at this point. Go back to line one. X is less than seven. Oops, it's true. We go to line two. X mod two is zero is true. We go to line three, we add one to i, i goes from two to three. We go to line seven, which adds one to x, x goes from four to five. We go back to line one, x is less than seven, is true. Go to line two, x mod two equals zero is false, because five divided by, five divided by two has a remainder of one. We go to line four, x mod three, is zero is also false because five divided by three has a remainder of two. Then we go to line seven, which adds one to x, x goes from five to six. We go back to line one, x is less than seven is true because six is still less than seven. We go to line two, x mod two equals to zero is we go to line three, we add one to i, i goes from three to four, and where do we go? Line seven. Yeah. Okay, now this, it should not be tricky at all, okay, because at this point we should understand that once we match one condition, the one on line two, we don't even try the one on line four, okay? But if someone is not careful or not understand the concept clearly, that person may go for line four and say, oh, it also matches this one because six is also wholly divisible by three. But we don't go for that line because we get out of the conditional statement as long as we finish, finish executing one of the branches. So we go to line seven at this point. It goes from, x goes from six to seven. We go back to line one. X is less than seven. It's false at this point. We get out of the loop and therefore we get to post. So as you can see, this one is really just quite boring, you know, for the most part, but it also tests whether people understand two concepts, two really important concepts. One is nesting, okay? We have a con multi-branch conditional statement inside a loop, okay? That's, that's, that's hierarchical or nesting. The second concept this particular code is testing is whether people understand a multi-branch conditional statement. You have to evaluate the conditions from top to bottom. Line two first, and if line two is false, only when that in that case you evaluate line four. Only when the condition of line two is false, you evaluate the condition on line four. Yep. What if line four is false? What would you do? Well, what do we do with in the case of five? X is five here. Okay, we get into the loop because x, x is still less than seven. X mod two equals to zero is false. We don't execute line three. X mod three is equal to zero is false. We do not execute line five. So we don't, we don't execute anything in the multi-branch conditional statement. If I had an else, then whatever is specified after else would execute if neither condition is met. But since I don't have an else, there's nothing to catch the, the last condition. Okay. Does anyone think the behavior of this program will change if I change the comparison? In other words, what if I change line two to test, test for x mod three equals to zero and line four to test for x mod two equals to zero? Does anyone think the behavior in terms of the outcome of i and j will change? Yes, it is. The answer is yes, it will change. Because of six and zero. Okay, in the case of zero, in this code, we increment i. But if I flip the order and test 
you know, well, I have to, you know, change, you know, the I and the J's too. But the six will definitely make a change. If the six will make a change, even even if I don't change the I and the J. No, does it? Yes, it would. What? It, it, in either case, it will change the, the results of the I and the J because in this case, the I and the J's do not end up with the same value. I is four and J is one. So, for just for practice purposes, you know, I will give you guys, you know, a kind of practice challenge is to change this program so this two becomes the three and this three becomes a two, and you can see for yourselves how the behavior of the program is going to change, and as a result of that the values of i and j will change as well. You can also change it so that you're not just changing the 2 here to a 3, you also make this j i into j. Okay, let me just spell it out so that you guys can do it. So I go to sheet 3 here, insert or paste. Okay, and I go to sheet 4 and do the paste as well here. So in one version, I am just changing the 2 and the 3. So I'm exchanging the 2 and the 3 of the mod operation. So run this one and see if the i and the j's will change, and they will. The second one will say, okay, I'm not only changing the 3 and the 2, but I also changed the i and the j at the same time. So this one will update j, and the other one will update i. Because some people may say, oh, tag, but you forgot to flip you know, the I and the J, and that's why the behavior, of the, the behavior of the program is changed. What if I flip it completely so that the condition goes with the variable? It will still get changed. Okay, so I want you guys to kind of execute, you know, on your own. Go to sheet 3 and sheet 4. Trace these two, you know, alternative versions of the same program and see that, you know, I and J do not end up with the same value. Okay, and that really is important because it shows you the importance of you know the ordering of the conditions in a multi-branch conditional statement. Yep. So is this is that like a more to do? Or? Sorry. You, mean you said you wanted us to go to sheet three and four and do the, the trace, right? Right. Is that our? It's not going to be graded. It's just a challenge. Okay, you know, just a challenge, you know, so that you guys can go through the process and see for yourselves the importance of the ordering of the conditions in a multi-branch conditional statement. How do we access the, um, or where do we find the, um, the spreadsheet file? Under? I'm going to save it. You know, under today's you know folder name. So by the time you know, if I remember to upload and the network is back up again, you will see it as. Um, 2011-0217 files in Moodle. Okay, so that's one test program. And let me make sure I save this. Let's go ahead and take a look at another one. And let's see. Okay, here we go. You can say if w is greater than or equal to x, then if w is greater than or equal to y, then z gets w, else a question mark here so that you guys can tell me what it is supposed to be okay and if else So now we have a conditional statement, a nested conditional statement structure with the wrong indentation. Okay? 
and I want you guys to finish up you know, this program so that it will find the maximum of x, y, and z, uh, excuse me, it will find the maximum of w, x, and y, and put the maximum in the variable z. What do you think you should do first? I would fix the indentations first. <laughs> okay, without the indentations, you can still kind of figure out what is going on, but it's not nearly as easy, you know, as with the right indentation. So if I fix the indentation, it will suddenly becomes a whole lot, suddenly become a whole lot easier, because you will see, you know, how the nesting works. Okay, so now we have the structure of the program done correctly. How would you replace the question marks with assignment statements? In other words, what do we put here? Um, Z becomes Y. Z becomes Y. Okay. Now, why would you think that Y is the maximum in this case? First of all, by the time we get here, what is the precondition? What is the precondition of line 5 here? That W is greater than Okay, so the, okay. let me just spell it out here. The precondition of line 5 is, how can we get here? On line 1, what condition of line 1 can get us here? Does it have to be true, or does it have to be false? It has, has to be true, okay. So we know W is greater than or equal to X has to be true. And what about the condition of line 2? What does it have to be to get us here? It has to be false. So that means x has to be less than y, right? If w is greater than or equal to x and w is less than y, w itself is not very useful, but it is useful as a bridge to help us relate what is the relationship between x and y. Because we know that y is greater than w, w is greater than or equal to x. So doesn't that make y the maximum? And that's why here, Z gets the value of Y is the proper answer. Can everybody see how the precondition analysis helped us, you know, write this code? Because by the time we get here, we know what has to be true. Well, for the same reason, we can also apply the same reason here. What is the precondition of line 9? W, well, let's see. W has to be less than X. That's right. Because... This entire thing, everything starting on line 8 all the way up to line 12, they are all with the else branch of the first condition. In other words, we won't end up here unless the condition on line 1 is false. So the first thing we know is the condition of line 1 has to be false. But again, there's another condition that has to be either true or false for us to be here. That has to be the condition of line 8. Does that have to be true or false for us to be, to be here? True. That one has to be true. Okay, so we say x is greater than or equal to y. Okay, so in this case, x is basically a bridge because it only helps us to relate, you know, y and w. Well, actually that's not the case. x is not a bridge. x is actually the maximum in this case because we say x is greater than w and x is greater than or equal to y. So that makes x the, the maximum of w, x, and y. And as a result, it makes sense here to say that z gets the value of x. Is that making any sense? Just by analyzing the precondition of all of these spots here, I can identify what is the proper assignment statement so that the overall code will find the maximum of the three variables. Well, there's only one to go, one left. Pre line pre eleven. But first of all, W has to be less than X because otherwise we won't end up on line eight to line twelve. The condition of line one has to be false to get uh, to get us to get us here. But secondly, hmm? X has to be less than Y because X is greater than or equal to Y has to be false. If I say X is greater than or less x is greater than or equal to y is false, it is the same thing as saying x is less than y. So in this case, you know, we have already established the relationship. 
y is greater than x and x is greater than w. So that means, you know, z has to get the value of y. That's it. So I might give you a question like this. I will leave out certain places. I will tell you what the program is supposed to do, except I leave out you know, certain pieces, and you have to figure out what those pieces are supposed to be. Yep. So the correct answer to the test would not only be replacing the correct values with question marks, but we need to explain how we got that by displaying the three values? Right, the rationale. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So let me save this one first. We'll call this ex one q three. But this is also a good example to illustrate, you know, all the pre and post conditions that we talk about. It is actually quite useful sometimes, okay? Because it can help you analyze a program and say, okay, by this time I know this condition has to be true, and therefore we should do these things for the algorithm to complete what it is supposed to do. Okay. Now knowing this stuff here. Let me ask you, you know, a question. Um, I'll just randomly pick one. Give me one test case so that we can test line nine. Well, line nine is the easy one. Let me let me pick another one. Line eleven. Give me one test case so that we can execute line eleven out of this program. In other words, find me specific values of w, x, and y so that line eleven will execute. Now you have to be a little bit careful here because we have two lines that will that will both match y being the maximum. Okay? Because we have line 5 here and we also have line 11 here. So you have to be a little bit more careful when you think about the case here. So w is 2, x is 3 and y is 7. Yep. That will Okay. How is this line and this line different? No, it has to do with how uh, W and X relate. One has to be true. Yep. For 11 to be reached, w, uh, one has to be false. Exactly. So if I, so, so let me just kind of explain this here. Okay, find a test case so that line 11 executes. Find specific values of W, X, and Y. Okay. The tricky part is you cannot just, you know, imagine a case where Y is the maximum because they both match the case where Y is maximum. The differenti the differentiate the dif differentiating factor is the relationship of W and X. On line 11, the precondition is W has to be less than X. The precondition of line 5 is W is greater than or equal to X. That's how you can divert your program to one or the other place. So in this case, you know, one specific case is to just pick W to be the, the minimum. So w, w being two is good. X is greater than that, okay, just make it one more than that. And Y is more than X, just make it one more than that. That will do it. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? So this is one potential type of question is to give you, you know, certain, this is two questions, okay? I won't ask you a question like this because if I ask you a question like this, then the first, the second part will depend on the first part. And that's usually not a good thing because I cannot give you partial credit for the second part if you get the, get the first part wrong to begin with. So I want to give you, I want to have more reasons to give people partial credit. So I will separate this into two different questions. One question for you to fill in the blanks, the second question to give you the complete code and ask you for a test case to test for one particular line to execute. Okay, so I go ahead and save this file. But the format is gonna be like this, okay? So it's not gonna be just you know, straightforward trace or straightforward you know, derivations, but it will be a different application of what you have learned in the class. <clears throat> Any questions up to this point?
No questions. Let's see if the network is up again. I can always disable and re-enable it. You know, it would automatically try to connect to the network. Yep, it's still down. I wonder how many classes will be affected, you know, when the network is down to the point that, you know, the class you know, cannot really go. A lot? I don't know. I mean, with face-to-face -face classes, I you would you would hope that you know the professor can teach a class, you know, even when the network is down. I can I just cannot access the material that I have, but I can still teach a class. Okay. Any? Yep. Can you give us an example of a routine statement, like a simple trace table for repeat the conditions, a repeat loop? A repeat loop? Sure. In fact, I'll give you an example that is not just a repeat loop, but it's also a good illustration of you know, dead branches, okay? <clears throat> so here we have, you know, a kind of funny looking thing, okay, so we'll, well, let me see. Okay, we'll just do a repeat here, and then I'll say if x is less than zero, then x gets Okay, so here we have a loop, <coughs> and we'll go ahead and trace this code. I cannot trace this code unless I give you the initial values of x, and the initial value of x itself, we only have one unknown in this case. So in the precondition, I'll give you something like x starts with a value of 2. Uh, we don't trace the line of repeat because repeat is just a marker and it doesn't really do anything useful. So we go start with line 2. Line 2 is testing x is less than 0. Is it true or is it false? It's false. So where do we go next? Line 5, we add 1 to x. x goes from 2 to 3. We go to line 6. Now line 6 is not just a marker line because it actually has something to do. It has to evaluate the condition to see whether x is greater than 5 at this point. And the answer is not. Okay, it is false. So that means we have to go where? Line two. Go back to line 2. x is less than 0 is false. Okay, because x is only getting bigger, there's no way it can be less than 0 anymore. So then we go to line 5 again. We increment it to 4. Go back to line 2, x is less than 0 is false, go to line 5, now it becomes 6, oops, okay, I wish, okay, hmm? oh, you're right, okay, I lost track, this should be line 6, right? is line 6. x is greater than 5 is false. We go back to line 2 one more time. x is less than 0 is false. Then we go to line 5. x goes from 5 to 6. We go to line 6. x is greater than 5 is true. And we are done. It's not, you know, it's not really that challenging. Let me ask you one question. What if I don't have x gets x plus 1 here, and instead I have x gets x minus 1? The way I set up x at this point, it will never end. It all depends on how I set it up. Okay. 
So let me, okay, I will work. Okay, let me save this file first, and I'll give. Uh, I'll save it under a different name for the second example. Let's so we'll call this exam one Q four, and I'll save it as a different name this time. Q four A, you know, which is an alternative. I just changed this to minus one. However, I go back to the precondition here. Oh, I didn't start with the first row either. That's okay. Easy to fix. Okay. The way it is right now, it will not work. Okay. But tag, it's okay because you know at some point if x becomes negative, we'll add one. Well, it's not going to help because the next line is negative one. In other words, it will just flip flop between two values. Okay, which is. Add one, subtract one. It will become negative one. It becomes you know, zero. Then it becomes you know. Then they will add one to it. Then it will become negative one again. It gets back to zero. Then it becomes negative one. It's back. It gets back to zero. So it will never get out. However, if I make this x here, so that it is, oh, let's say you know, seven to begin with, then it will work. Okay. So let's go ahead and see why this is not an infinite loop given that x starts with a value of 7. It's fairly obvious. But exactly. Because after one iteration, it will still have 6, which is enough to get us out of the loop. Okay, But that becomes tricky because I, if I make this x you know, 6 or below, then it becomes an infinite loop. Okay. I will just go ahead and save this one. I'll leave it up to you guys to trace it. I mean, it's not really that hard to trace it. <clears throat> Any questions at this point? Now, before I forget, I also want to kind of, you know, bring up something that we talked about last time. Not this stuff here. This is assembly language programming. You don't want to deal with that at this point. Not yet. But many of you will, okay? <laughs> Okay, remember last time I made a claim and I said I can make my um, find prime factor algorithm a whole lot faster? Can I remember that? Okay, it has to do with something like this. It has to do with, um, okay, restrict A as it is a non, okay, is a positive integer. Restrict B is a positive integer. In other words, give me any A and any B. Okay? As long as A is positive and B is positive and both are integers, the following is going to be true. Okay? Define P to be A times B, the product of A and B. Tag claims that. Remember this? Vaguely? Okay, but it doesn't have to be. You know, one will work too. Did I prove it? I didn't prove it, right? No. I just made the claim. Okay. Okay. So my claim is okay, there are two ways to look at the claim. One way to look at the claim is A times A is less than or equal to P, or B times B is less than or equal to P. The other way to look at it is is to say that the square root of a is less than or equal to, oops, I take it the other way, a is less than or equal to the square root of p, or b is less than or equal to the square root of p. Okay, just two ways of looking at the same thing. The question is, does it make sense? Oh yeah, it seems to make sense. You know, you pick any a and any b, let's say four and five. Doesn't even have to be prime. 4 times 5 is what? 20. 20. But yet 4 times 4 is 16, and 16 is less than or equal to 20. That's good. I only need at least one side to be true, right? Let's pick 5 and 5, 25, okay? A is 5, B is 5, A times, a times B is 25. In that case, A times A is less than or equal to 25 already, okay? So it seems to make sense. Try to find me an A and a B, and this is not true. Okay? You can find for a whole day, you can find you know, for a whole year, you can spend the rest of your time you know, trying to find an A and a B, and it won't, you cannot find a counterexample. 
just because we cannot find a counterexample, does it prove that this has to be true for all A's and B's? No, it's not enough, okay? It's a good hunch that it may be true for all cases, but it's not a proof. The question is, how do you prove something like this? Well, we can prove by contradiction, okay? Proof by contradiction is really fun because, you know, it is one of the most powerful techniques in mathematics to prove something, and yet it is somewhat counterintuitive. Did I use the socks example last time? Okay. So let's just say that you know, I have only one kind of socks in my drawer because I'm lazy. I don't want to have to match my socks, right? It's also easy to replace socks, you know, because you know, just buy more. You just put it into the drawer, and then you have, you know, you don't have to care about, you know, matching. I only have one kind of socks in my drawer, and my claim is I only have to draw, I only have to pick up two socks in the dark, and I have one pair. Makes sense, right? Prove it. Hmm? You only have one kind, so for sure they're going to be identical. Well, I can also prove it by contradiction. Now, to prove by contradiction is to say tech was wrong. Okay? In other words, now there are two ways to look at this as tech is wrong. You can say tech can pull two socks out of the, the drawer and it does not make one pair. Now, what does that mean? If I take two socks out of my drawer and it does not make one pair, that means I have two kinds of socks. And what does that contradict with? It contradicts with my assumption, right? My assumption is that I only have one kind of socks. So every time you have a contradiction like that, it means the claim, the original claim, has to be true. That's proved by contradiction, which is a very powerful technique. So here I can also do the same thing, okay? So let's go ahead and prove by contradiction. Contradiction. Okay, let's say tax wrong. Tag is wrong. Now, what does it mean when I'm wrong? When I'm wrong, that means this is not true. I can find an A that is a positive integer. I can find a B that is a positive integer, and yet I can. I, I, I keep the definition. P is the product of A and B, and yet this is not true. Okay, that's that will be you know, that. That's that's what happens when I'm wrong. Is that making any sense? You have to keep the assumptions, but you basically say the claim itself is wrong. Okay. So that means someone can find A and B both positive integers. Define P to be A times B, same thing as before, and yet it is not true that, and I'll just pick one format here, I'll pick the first one. It is not true that A times A is less than or equal to P, or B times B is less than or equal to P. Is that okay with everybody so far? That if I'm wrong, it simply means that someone at some point can find an A and a B, both are being, they're both being positive integers. And you can still define P to be the product of A and B, and yet what I knew, what I claimed before is not true anymore. That's what happens when I'm wrong. <clears throat> but that's the same as saying for these A or A this set of A, B, and P. What, what, what does it mean when this is false? What is another way to put this? A times A is greater than P, and B times B is greater than P. Okay, let's, let's see whether people can do this, okay? Let's see whether you guys can equate these two. Okay. I'll just do it this way. Okay, does it make sense? Yes. Is it okay? Okay, let, let's see whether this makes sense or not. Okay, this negation applies to the entire disjunction, okay? It is not the case that 
a times a is less than or equal to b, or b times b is less than or equal to p. Is that saying the same thing as a times a is greater than p, and b times b is greater than p? Yes. Yes, it means exactly the same thing. Okay? Okay. This is B. Morgan's Law in Boolean Algebra. Okay. But anyway, they are the same. Okay, so without proving they're the same, you know, we'll just claim they're the same. What does that mean? When I say A times A is greater than P and B times B is greater than P, that implies that A times A times B times B is greater than P times P. Does it make sense? Because I just take this component here, which is the larger of the two, stash it here. I take B times B, which is the larger component between these two, put it here. And I put the smaller components, P and P, over here. Does it make sense? It makes perfect sense, especially when we know all terms are non-negative, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. A and B are non-negative, P is definitely non-negative. Okay. But don't we have a little bit of a problem here? Because I can I can change the order of the multiplication because multiplication is commutative. So I can now say this is the same as A times B times A times B. Right? And I can regroup the order of the multiplication. So I can group A times B first. And then I can group A times B also, just like that. But by definition, what is A times B? It's P. It's our product. So now we have P times P is greater than P times P. And that's a contradiction. I can never find a case where a number's square is greater than the number's square itself. So that means the con this is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. So what does it mean? That means I cannot be wrong. <laughs> I could not have been wrong with my claim originally, which is another way to say the claim has to be true. Now, let's go back to the context. Why do I want to do this? Why do I want to prove that this is the case? How does it help my algorithm? Exactly. So this means that if if I if I give you a number, okay, let's say 117, okay, it doesn't matter which one. If I give you a number, let's say 117, but 117 is not A, it is not B, it is P, okay? And I just say that, let's just say that 117 is a composite number. It has two factors other than itself. One of those factors has to be less than or equal to the square root of 117. If I test all integers up to a number such that that number's square is larger than p, I can now confirm that p itself is a prime number. Okay, let me just rephrase that. Okay, let me take this take this definition here. Move it down here. Okay. But we change this so that we say we know that Okay. This means that if P is a composite number, does everybody understand what is a composite number? It's a non-prime number, okay? Not prime and not one. Because one is also a not prime number, so we have to be clear here. So if P is a composite number, then of a pair of factors, a and B, at least one has to be less than or equal to ah, the square root of P. Okay. <clears throat> Does it make sense? If I give you a number, let's say one, two, three, four, seven, okay, which I don't know whether it's a prime number or not. 
One, two, three, four, seven. Yeah, that's pretty hard to determine. One, two, three, four, seven. Let, let's just write it on the board. So I'm claiming that if I, start, if I start with two, and then test three, and then test four, and then test five, and so on, if I test all the way, if I t keep testing like this, if this number has a factor, I would have found that factor before I reach the square root of this number. Is that making any sense? Okay. So this also means that if we cannot find a factor that is less than or equal to the square root of p, then p has to be prime. Does that make any sense? So that means I can change my algorithm now so instead of going, let's say this is a prime number. I don't have to test all the way up to 12,347. I only have to test up to approximately the square root of this number. Is that significant saving? It is it's, it's significant saving for larger numbers. For small numbers, nah, it's not as much. You know, but for, for large numbers, this is a quick way for me to get out of the loop. Is that making any sense so far? Now let me ask you this question. Okay, look at this number here. Is that prime or is it not? We don't know. Okay. How does the square root of this number compare to this number itself? They are different. They're the square root is significantly smaller than the number itself. And that's why this is useful, because this technique will help us you know, get out early when this is a prime number itself. If this is a prime number and we don't do this optimization, we have to test all the way up to the number itself to determine, oh, yes, it is a prime number. Now we can get out. But knowing the fact that we know now, we can get out when we test only up to the, up to the square root of this number, and then we can say, oh, since we cannot find a factor up to this point, we know there are no factors after this point either, and therefore this number has to be prime. Okay, and that's why it is useful to know the fact that we just proved. Any questions about that? No, it's a little bit out of context. <laughs> okay, so this is it. We will still meet on Tuesday. If you have any questions about the material that will be in the test based on the, today's sample test questions, bring it on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, we'll have the actual test. It's going to be printed. We'll take the test here in this classroom.